Politico is a brand that began uh, in the US. Uh, crucially, its expansion um, outside uh, that market uh, has been a story from which we could all learn. And we're now able to hear of that story from the executive editor of Politico Europe, based in Belgium, Matt Kaminsky. Matt. Thanks so much. It's great to be here with you in this uh, fabulous setting. Um, I want to start maybe with uh, two confessions. Uh, my first confession is that someone told me 18 months ago that I'd be speaking to anyone about uh, digital innovation. I would have laughed in their face. I, I came from a world where the party that you're having here uh, was spoiling my party. I was uh, almost 20 years at the Wall Street Journal uh, where uh, uh, it was uh, great to be at the Wall Street Journal when we had 30% margins and a uh, monopoly newspaper. Uh, and I think we've adjusted to the digital world over there, uh, but it certainly has made things uh, more difficult. Um, my second confession is that I don't think I have, that may not be very much, at least it seems to me, uh, about digital or innovation that you may hear from me today. I, I think that we um, come at this with some fairly basic principles that may seem self-evident, although I think when I repeat it, they don't always uh, sound that way. One is that uh, we do content. Uh, that's really what we are. We, we, we are a content provider. We are an old school journalistic enterprise based on reporting. Uh, we have a very, uh, we, we want to have a very clear idea of what kind of audience we are trying to attract to Politico and what kind of journalism it would take to uh, get that audience to uh, be essentially hooked or uh, we call them Politico addicts. Uh, for us, the uh, traffic is a secondary, if not a tertiary concern. It is certainly not the way that we measure whether we're doing a good job or not. And I would say that we're platform neutral. In that sense, I would not even call Politico a digital business. It is a media business, and we provide the content that we need to get an audience, that we need to build a business, uh, any which way uh, that audience happens to want to consume the, the content. And I just want to kind of start with that as a, as a general principle and then talk to you a little bit about more specifically about what we've done and why we've done it and, and, and I hope our um, uh, sort of offer up a case study in, in how we hope to make uh, journalism in the 21st century uh, work and obviously to, to pay. Uh, a very brief history, Politico was founded in 2007 in Washington by uh, two former Washington Post uh, journalists, and they became they began with the idea that one that the n publications of the 21st century will be m more niche publications. That the era of the great general interest newspapers that emerged from the 19th century um, is over. That if you want to make this work, you should just pick one thing that you're trying to be good at and do it better than anyone else. So their one thing is uh, politics. Uh, uh, an, another good example is ESPN in the US. They do one thing, which is sports. So we, we try and do for politics what ESPN has done for sports. They started with 30 people. Uh, they've now grown to around, or we've now grown in the US to around uh, 400 people. Uh, we um, came to Europe uh, mostly thanks to Axel Springer, which approached Politico in the US saying, it'd be great if we could join forces and do something here. Uh, in Europe. Let's bring the Politico approach to journalism, which is uh, uh, really a laser focused on just doing politics and policy in a way that's uh, accurate, first of all. Uh, just again, I mentioned we were old school journalism. Accurate, uh, smart, uh, fast. And, and the fast was an innovative thing uh, 10 years ago. It is less so today, but at the time was that uh, our readers, our core readers, the politicos of, of Washington uh, wanted things uh, that happen right now to appear in their email box and they couldn't wait until the morning paper to read about it. So that was the approach to journalism that we wanted to bring over here that is very similar to what we uh, uh, do in the US. The other um, thing that we brought, we brought over the same business model. Uh, we had no idea if it would work, but the 
business model, and I'll get into it in some more detail, is a hybrid of a B2C and a, and a, and a B2B um, uh, business. Uh, and that we thought that, you know, Brussels is not Washington, but there are enough similarities. There's lots of lobbyists, lots of politicians, lots of lawyers, lots of companies trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, lots of people jockeying, posturing for, for power. Um, it seems to be our kind of place. Uh, the thing that's very different is I think Politico, if you go in the newsroom or if, if you read it and if you know the U.S. site, it does, it is a different kind of bird because Europe is not America uh, and Brussels at the end of the day is, is not Washington. Uh, we launched last year in April. Um, our one year anniversary is coming up uh, next month with around uh, 30 editorial staff. We've since grown to almost 50 editorial staff looking to uh, get up to um, around 70. But let me just go through uh, our uh, short story and, and then hopefully uh, open it up to you for questions. Um, so we really did focus on Brussels for a couple of reasons. I mean, I guess we could have, in theory, said, let's do a German language, politico.de, we'll hire 40 people in Berlin and really cover this town in the way that we cover Washington. Could have done the same thing in, in, in London. But the first step into Europe was Brussels. Why Brussels? Everyone said Brussels is really, really boring. Um, well, we thought that actually any place which is political can't be boring. Uh, the journalists are the ones who are, who are boring if it comes across that way. We also thought that Brussels would be a great beachhead for us in, in Europe. It's a place where there was a completely open um, space, really, for a publication that was coming at the political story in Europe, trying to cover pan-European politics uh, free of any national or political agenda. We are, uh, uh, and I'll show you a slide later on, we're kind of like a tower of Babel. We really don't, because of our spirit connection, uh, we, we're not fully American, but also not fully, fully German either. Um, and uh, uh, and our, our staff reflects that. But Brussels is a place which didn't have anyone who was covering pan-European politics for an audience that was not necessarily huge, but was certainly quite lucrative, that the most important people in the world who have a big say or a big stake in what happens in Europe, um, they were not being fully served. They were getting a little bit, a few courses from the FT. Uh, there were some local publications that I don't think were satisfying their, um, their appetite as well. So we saw an opening to move in. And we also saw that compared to Washington, Brussels was underserved by, by the media. That in Washington, for every 10 trade journalists in, in DC covering every little tidbit going through Congress, you had only maybe one person in Brussels doing the same thing. And, um, and so we decided to say, we are gonna go big in Brussels. We're gonna put uh, our, our headquarters there, but we're also going to put um, a lot of journalistic firepower that we are trying, the other um, kind of American phrase is flood the zone. Uh, sort of big, bring it bigger, bring it faster, and hopefully bring it smarter. Um, but we also, uh, not being completely ignorant Americans, and I will say that I was born on the European continent, and despite my accent, I do, uh, most of my family is from here, and uh, um, we, we also realized that Brussels is not Washington, sense that it's not the center of power the way it, that Washington is. That really, Brussels is more a stage where all these various actors, you know, from stage right comes in Angela Merkel and stage left Hollande, they do meet there, but the real power is in some ways is back in the capitals. So we uh, have opened fairly significant uh, offices both in Berlin, Paris, London, we have someone uh, in, in Warsaw uh, regularly, and as well as a network of correspondence throughout the uh, continent. We are the biggest newsroom um, in Brussels, uh, if, except for Xinhua, who has its European headquarters in Brussels. I think Xinhua does many things, so uh, I'm not sure quite how comparable it is, but we're more than double or triple the combined size of the Reuters and Bloomberg offices there. And we're trying, what are we trying to do? We're trying to provide content both on our website. We have a weekly newspaper uh, that that's, comes out in limited distribution. Um, but we also want to put our journalism on stage. So we've, uh, last year we had 22 events, uh, mostly in Brussels, but in Berlin and Paris and London as well. 
and really try to kind of bring a, um, a new voice, a new approach, that we're not trying to do anything that anyone else has done, and we're not trying to take anyone's cake. I think we're trying to bake our own cake and then, and then eat it too. Um, so we came up, um, I don't know why my name's on there, but anyway, um, we really wanted to sort of bring the journalism a, a different flavor. Uh, and, and there's sort of three examples of, of stories that I think that, that we have done that you would not have seen in the Financial Times or in other newspapers. One, we had a, uh, in, in November, we had a, uh, we put out a, a magazine. You know, we also put out glossy magazines. Uh, we even started a monthly or bi-monthly in the U.S. Because again, we're platform agnostic. It is not relevant how you get the news. It is important that you get it the way that you want to have it and that we can sell advertising against it or, or sell you a subscription at a, at a premium price. So anyway, we did a list of the Politico 28, the, who we thought were the most, uh, the people who were shaking, stirring, and, and changing Europe. And um, everyone last year, Time Magazine, the FT, made, uh, put Angela Merkel as the woman of the year in Europe. And we thought, well, let, let, let's, let's be a bit different. So we chose Viktor Orban as the guy who is really uh, a, a trendsetter, whether you love him or, or you despise him, and I'm sure uh, I can guess where the feelings are in this room, but um, that kind of got a lot of attention. Uh, I spent uh, a very um, enlightening uh, three hours with him in, in Budapest. Um, the second story I, I would just mention very briefly was a, uh, a very long investigative piece about uh, the Romanian commissioner named uh, Corinna uh, Krechu, who um, doesn't turn up to work very often, uh, most of her staff has quit in the last year, has used her driver to ferry around uh, her, um, her family members and, and friends. And this is a story that um, I, I can't imagine any other publication would devote the resources to that we did. But part of what we want to do, we want to break news in Brussels. We want to become an indispensable read. But we also want to do conversation driving journalism that holds those institutions accountable in the way that no one else has tried to do. Uh, that story was, um, got tons of attention in Brussels. It also got tons of attention in Romania. It prompted the European Parliament to hold hearings and it sort of uh, really started a conversation about, you know, are all these commissioners uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing? So we're trying to bring a, a different approach to political journalism here. Um, now, as I mentioned that um, for us, the key metric is who is reading us, not how many people are reading us. Uh, but like all journalists, we love to be read uh, by as many people as, as possible. Uh, we got to uh, one million uh, monthly uniques in three months, which is more or less uh, how long it took the US site to get to one million uniques. And we hit a peak in, in December where you had uh, the um, uh, follow up from the Paris attacks and a lot of the Polka 28 got tons of coverage. Um, so we, we have, we're, 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 we're more than a, we have more than a niche audience, but I would still come back that we care most about our niche audience. That if we are being read by the 100 most important people who uh, care or have a, have a big say in what happens in this part of the world, uh, that's enough. It's enough for us to build a business. It's also enough for us to have a thriving uh, publication. Um, Obviously, we, we, we make a lot of noise, the way I'm making a lot of noise here about what, what, what we do. I think that's, in a, di in a digital world, you have to stand out, uh, and hopefully you stand out with your journalism. Um, one case study, we have a Brussels playbook, which is really, you know, Politico, now it's very common for people to do this. Politico was one of the earliest ones to discover uh, something called the email, which is a very effective uh, delivery platform for journalism and, and for news. Um, Mike Allen's uh, playbook in Washington is read by Obama on down. And so we started one written by Ryan Heath in, in Brussels. He's now up to 43,000 readers, uh, nine and 10 commissioners. Um, it really is the talk of the town. Uh, if you want to know what Brussels is, is what the conversation is about. Uh, Ryan is the way you start. It comes in your email box 7 a.m. And it's been a very, um, and, and Ryan has sort of taken his show on the road. He does pl uh, playbook breakfasts, which are, uh, which is a, um, a, a very, um, an event where he sits down with a, with a newsmaker. It's really the way that we try and lead the conversation in, 
in the city. Um, and it was very kind of gratifying that in January, uh, Burson Marcelo did a survey of EU influencers, uh, members of parliament, lobbyists, people in the commission, who do you read the most? Uh, and we were number one after nine months of existence. Uh, it's very gratifying that my former home, the Financial Times, was at, it was, was, was high, but, 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 but still behind, and then kind of sad that my other former home, the Wall Street Journal, was even further behind uh, uh, there. Um, now, uh, this gives you a sense of uh, where we uh, we have a very where we reach. I think we have a very um, eighty percent of our audience is not in uh, is not in the U.S. In the U.S., we benefit from three hundred and twenty million English language speakers and people who know the political brand. Most of those readers, there's a mix of people who care about Europe, but most of it is social, and most of it tends to be one and out. Our European readership, and especially the one in Brussels, by that all-important measure of stickiness. Do people stay on your site, or do they just come because they see something on their Facebook page and have no idea where they're going? Um, now, our audience is clearly not a mass audience. I wouldn't pretend it to be. Um, uh, we're not at 160 million. We're not even at 1.6 million. Um, but in terms of sort of measuring, being able to, to show that people come to our site regularly, um, 40% uh, of our traffic comes through the home page. So people do go to our home page because they're coming to Politico as opposed to an individual story. Um, our um, uniques versus page views ratio is about one to three. But if you narrow it down to Brussels or certain uh, neighborhoods in Berlin and Washington, it's about one to five, one to six, which is a way that we can tell advertisers that People stay with us, they come to us regularly, and it's exactly the kind of people that you're trying uh, to reach. Um, we've tried to, uh, since uh, homepage advertising, as you all know better than I do, is, is not really probably the sort of the, the, the future for, for any of us. We've tried to sort of help advertisers conceive of ways they can get their message across and how they can kind of, they can underwrite uh, what we consider to be cool, cool, cool journalism. Here's one example with uh, Westinghouse uh, supported our coverage of the COP21 uh, conference. Let me just quickly um, go to one last slide, which is uh, what we're trying to do this year. Having planted the flag in Brussels, we now want to expand our audience in Berlin, in London, and in Paris. We have a German language uh, playbook style email called Morgan Europa that Florian Eder writes. You can sign up on our site. It's a way to try and uh, really be a gateway drug for uh, people who don't necessarily, who obviously are fluent in English, but don't really necessarily turn to an English language publication first thing in the morning. Uh, so we are experimenting with uh, different languages and building different bridges. We're going into financial services coverage where uh, we, 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 we cover the city of London. And a brief word about our business model. These are some of our launches. As I mentioned, that half our business is a B2C business. So, and it's not an easy business, as, as again, as, as you probably know better than I do, uh, trying to sort of get uh, companies, advertisers to underwrite events uh, by advertising in our paper, in our, and on the site. The other half is something called Politico Pro, and that's the B2B component of it. You wouldn't see it unless you are a subscriber. You, you can really, it's very hard to find on our site even what it might be. But what it is is a premium journalism for a premium audience at a, at a premium price where we cover, um, it's almost like a Bloomberg terminal for policy professionals. We cover te technology, energy, uh, trade uh, coming down the road with uh, larger teams than anyone else has. And that is considered to be, this is what can make our business stable and allow me to hire more people. I've babbled on too long, so let me stop there and see if there are any, any questions. So I'm afraid we are, because we've got, the people have got to get on to other sections, we're going to have to uh, take questions in the, in the break if we possibly can. Um, so can I ask you please to thank Matt Kaminsky. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.